and we're in. All right, so good morning, everybody. I'm so happy to have you here today and happy to welcome you. I've been, I have no idea what this message is going to be like. Um, I'm going to type up an after action report in Portuguese and give up after the service. So get a, uh, see, electronic, Correo Electronico, Espanol, email. I'll send you this message after the service. Okay. So anyway, as we get into it today, I don't know, I'm not going to lie, I might get a little excited. So you'll just have to wait and see. The title of today's message. <laughs> the title of today's message is, I don't know yet. So maybe when the service is over, these are the four best choices that I had for today's message. What's missing in the church? That would be a good title for today's message before it goes on YouTube. Faithful. You can count on me, or have you considered Jesus? It's one of those things I couldn't pick up over the title this morning. So let's go to Hebrews 3 1, and we're going to read 3 1, and then we're going to pray, and then we're going to get started today. I'm going to put on my glasses. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful in his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Let's pray. Father God, we God, we thank you so much, God, for this day. God, we... Uh, God, we just ask, God, that the words spoken here today, God, reflect your heart and that it's your message. God, help me to teach it and divide the word accurately, God, as Paul said that he would. God, we thank you. I thank you for each and every each and every person here today, God. I thank you for the children in the back, God. God, let this church be about you and your business. Father, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's just go into it. So if you remember, Hebrews 1, quick recap. Hebrews chapter 1, coming out. What are we looking at? Number one, Jesus is better than the prophets. And then the author goes from Jesus is better than all the prophets to Jesus is better than angels. And then he reaches a point where uh, one of my favorite verses was actually Hebrews 2, 1. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we've heard. He finally goes into that big section And one of my other favorite verses. What am I saying? They're all my favorite verse. That's crazy. (laughs) This is my favorite verse. And so is this one and this one. And every single verse is my favorite verse. 66 books of it. But Hebrews 2.3 said, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? So if you remember, the author comes back and he says, Jesus, he's better than the prophets. Jesus, he's better than the angels. And he finally takes a second and looks up and he says, what should you do with this information? You should get saved. You should give your life to Jesus. And then we went on through last week and he tells us that we're now a part of a new family. Last week, Sister Sandra finished by playing the family of God on the piano. Because that's literally what we are. When we come to Christ, we are now sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. Which means, if we're sons and daughters, it means we're all one what? We're all one family. And what's funny, that's exactly what a church is. It's a family. And now to start chapter 3, we have another therefore. It means looking back at everything you've learned so far. Therefore, holy brethren... And when he starts this off, holy brethren, first of all, the word holy means set apart. 
It's kind of funny. We mentioned it in Sunday school this morning, though. But the word holy itself means to be set apart. As I was sitting here getting ready for this message, I got to think, that's one of the problems with the church today. We don't look set apart. Right. If you're a born-again Christian, you should look different than the rest of the world. There should be something different about you. You shouldn't feel comfortable in every situation where the rest of the world is in. There should be a different. Holy means set apart. We can't be set apart if we're engaging in every single thing that the world is engaged in. There's got to be something. There's, I don't know where that line is, guys. But somewhere in their life, you have to make this decision that you're going to be something different. You're not going to look like the world. It may be little things like a Y'all Need Jesus t-shirt. It's, but there should be something about you. Matter of fact, I'll take it a step further. The Y'all Need Jesus t-shirt's no good if your life doesn't look like you could offer Jesus. Talk the talk, walk the walk. But we should be, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. So he launches this and he's speaking to Christians right now. Holy brethren. Hebrews is written to Jewish Christians, but you'll also see it's written to lost people <coughs> later on. You'll see a direct where he literally is looking at lost people in the church and makes a plea to those lost people. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. The word consider is one of the biggest words. There's, I'm not going to go into a big Greek lesson this day. I wrote it down. Let's see if I can pronounce it right. <coughs> I cannot. Kantano, kantanoeo. Ah, kantanoeo. Ah, said it right. It's the word in the Greek. I had to get it. That's hard to... I don't speak Greek. Kantanoeo. <coughs> is the word in the Greek. But here's the thing, the word consider, I wouldn't bring it up, but the word consider does not do justice to what the writer is saying. When he says, therefore, holy brethren, look at everything you've learned. If you've been here for the last five weeks, think about everything you've heard in Hebrews for five weeks. And now he says, therefore, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Could this word, this word consider, what it means is, this is not like, Brother Roger, have you ever considered using Splenda instead of Sweet and Low? That's not what this word means. It's not like, have you ever thought about doing this instead of that? The word consider literally means to take a deep look. This means you need to stop what you're doing. You need to find a quiet moment. And you and Jesus need to have a heart to heart. It means you need to spend some time in reflection. This is not a momentary thing. This is something where your entire life hangs in the balance on the person of who Jesus Christ is. So who is the person Jesus Christ? He says, consider the apostle. Apostolos in the Greek. It means to be sent. It's one that's sent. And we don't normally think about Jesus as an apostle, but Jesus was sent. Who sent Jesus here? It was his father. His father is the one that sent Jesus here. So the apostle, Jesus, a, he carries a message. As a matter of fact, if you remember Jesus, he's always quick to say that the message he brought wasn't even his, right? The message he brought was from who? So the, another translation of the word apostle is also ambassador. He carried a message from another source to tell us. So consider the apostle and high priest. High priest, this is another one of these. This is cool, brother uh, Mark David. You're going to appreciate this. High priest, uh, the word when they translate it to make the Latin Bible, it's called a pontifex in the Latin Bible. A pontifex is literally the Latin word for bridge builder. Amen. Pontifex is a bridge builder. When they were trying to translate high priest in the Latin, they had to find a word to, to translate it. Uh, the word in the Greek, I wrote it down. In the, in the Greek, it's actually, um, arche, 
I'm not going to say it because I'd embarrass myself. Arcarius. Close enough. They couldn't find the word to translate it. So when they were trying to write the Latin Bible, they used the word pontifex, bridge builder, to best represent what Jesus Christ does. And I brought up Mark David because he's got this little evangel cube. It's a cube that he uses when he evangelizes the gospel. And he'll go through the cube and fold it in different ways, and he'll talk about man's sinful nature, he'll talk about God, and then he'll fold out one part of it, though, and it's a cross. And the cross is a gap that bridges lost man to holy God, and it's a bridge that's built. And I thought, high priest is so perfect in that regard. Christ is the bridge that gets us to God. He is the pontifex, the high priest. Consider the, pon the apostle and high priest of our confession. The word confession is a word you've heard me say a bunch. Uh, in order to become saved, we must confess Jesus as Lord. It means homologeo in the Greek. It means to say the same thing. It means we need to say the same thing. Who Jesus said he is, we need to say what? We need to say the same thing. <laughs> Who's Jesus? Who he said he is. That's a very simple breakdown. Who is Jesus? Who he said he is. Every single word, that's exactly who he said he is. Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him as Moses also was faithful in all his house. One of the things I underlined in this section, I underlined every time it said faithful in this section, and that was one of the things that stuck out to me the most was the word faithful. That's why I almost titled the message that. Consider Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him. Again, Jesus was here because he was about his father's business. I was looking up in my Bible dictionary this morning what faithful is. It means that you can rely on somebody. When God the Father sent Jesus here, it meant he could rely on Jesus to do what Jesus was supposed to do. He who was, was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful. So here's what's going on. Jesus is better than the prophets. Jesus is better than the angels. But now think to a Jew. Who can be better than Moses, right? <laughs> okay. We agree. Jesus definitely better than the angels, better than the prophets. But come on, Moses. You can't argue that one with me. Jesus can't be better than Moses, right? I'm a Jew. Well, look at what the author says. Who is faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful to in all his house. What was interesting, I love how it, it opens up with Moses being faithful. And if you look in this section, God never brings up the times when Moses fell. Moses murdered an Egyptian. Moses in the wilderness didn't even get to come into the promised land. Do you remember why? God told him, speak to a stone. And what did he do? He smoked the stone. And because of his disobedience, he didn't even go into the promised land. But God doesn't say anything about that in the scripture. God only talks about the good things about who Moses is. And guys, we've said that over and over for you. When God sees you now, God doesn't see the mess that you are now. Amen. God already sees you as the completed work that stands in glory one day. He sees you, if you're covered by the blood, He sees you as forgiven right now. He doesn't see you for the mistakes that you've made. And therefore, with Moses... God doesn't need to mention the mistakes to talk about how good God is. God brings up Moses and he says he was faithful in a way that Christ Jesus was faithful also. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. For this one, notice the capital in the one. So who's he referring to? The one is Jesus. For this one has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. 
Why? Why is Jesus better than Moses? He makes a very simple definition. One has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone. <coughs> Can I take it just a second to point that out? For every house is built by someone. We talked about this in Sunday. Brother Brian, you just ripped off the entire message today. You should have been here for Sunday school. <laughs> Guys, it's not hard to look at this building and think, Was did someone have a design when building this building? A design is present here, correct? If you look at a home, there's a designer. There's a design. There is nothing. What's funny, as a physicist, I have to say... Earth itself, the solar system, the perfection of the universe cannot be explained through physics. As a matter of fact, you don't know what all my physics tells me? There had to be a designer. That's what my knowledge of physics tells me, that nothing that we see is an accident. Every house is built by someone. The universe was built by someone. Someone designed everything we see. And what's funny is I sit there and look at it. The atheistic statement, and my son knows I don't like the word stupid, but I'm going to use it. I'm going to stare at the screen. The atheistic statement that this is just a complete random coincidence, it's stupid. It's just a dumb argument. Because for you to look at creation, for me to look at the universe, for me to look at the perfection of the earth setting 23 and a half degrees, 1.495 times 10 to 11 kilometers from the sun, for me to look at all these things, gravity 9.81 meters per second square, for me to look at all these factors, I see perfect design in all of it. So when we see a house, we know someone built the house. And here the author says, Moses is great. Moses was faithful to the house, but why is Jesus better than Moses? Jesus, Moses didn't build the house. Right. You with me, amen? Moses didn't build the house. Who built the house? Every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses indeed was faithful. Got to underline it again. I did in my Bible. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ as a son is over his own house. Moses is faithful as a servant in his own house. By the way, the word house, I know I'm, I'm doing like a Greek lesson today. I almost want to apologize for that, but you need to know some of these things. When we talk about the house of God, it's oikos is the word in the Greek. The only reason, believe it or not, I remember that, there's a yogurt named oikos, which means family in Greek, our house. So it's house in the Greek. So we've got this house of God. The house of God is not this building. The house of God is it's the family of God that makes up. Moses was faithful to the house, but Jesus is the one who built this house. There's not a single person present here today that God has not worked with in order for you to be here today. Moses, Moses, Albert. I'll take it, brother. It was better than your last acting role, right? Way better. Way better. He was Judas in my last church play that I was in. So Moses is definitely working on the positive. <laughs> Brother Albert, you being here today is no accident. Amen. You being a part of the family of God is no accident. God built this family. God built this house. And now he says Moses, Moses is wonderful because Moses was faithful in the way he served the house. Moses was faithful in the way he served the house. But Jesus is the one that built the house. 
So you can't compare Moses and Jesus. While Moses was a good servant, this is Jesus' house. This is Jesus' family. And we belong to the family of God, which is Jesus. But what stood out most to me over this, because look, he says, Christ is a son over his own house. In other words, this is Christ's house. He owns this house. He is an heir of his house. You see, servants come and go. Moses was a servant. Servants come and go. One day, Brother Roger's sitting on that pew, but you know if this church lasts long enough, you know what will happen? Brother Roger will come. Brother Roger will go. And God will bring another person to sit in that spot one day. Servants come and go, but Jesus is an heir of the house, which means Jesus in the house of God lasts for what? Jesus lasts forever. And there's the reasoning of why Jesus is better. But what I want you to notice most of all out of all this, go all the way back to the beginning. Because as I was getting ready for this message today, I was like, this is what's missing in the church today. Jesus himself was faithful to God who appointed him. As Moses was faithful to all his house. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant. Guys, it's what we're missing in the church today. We're missing faithfulness. We're missing that ability to rely on people. Uh, I got to thinking about it heavily. It was J. Vernon McGee I listened to that really put this in my heart the other day. And guys, somebody will think, man, he's chewing somebody out. I'm not chewing anybody out of this church today. But I'm going to be honest. When I lost my voice last year, you know, there was eight weeks I didn't do anything around here. I reached out to Brother Roger, Mark David. They heard a little bit, James and Brian. And somewhere in the middle of all that, you know what I was sitting here thinking? Eight weeks, I haven't preached. What's having to start go through my mind? Might be time for y'all to get another pastor. I mean, I promise, if you think just because I'm the pastor, I didn't, don't go through some bad days, and I'm sitting there thinking of everything, and it's like, and I literally, I reached out to Brother Roger in particular, and I was like, because I know how most churches are, and I was like, if there's a conversation going around in the background that it's time for y'all to get a new pastor, I won't stand in the way. I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to stand in the way if that's a conversation. And Brother Roger is quick to tell me there is no conversation like that going on around here. And then he said something that was powerful to me. He said, just because you're not standing there on Sunday mornings doesn't mean you're not still the pastor of this church. And I promise during the whole time there was nothing going on around here that I didn't, wasn't abreast of and didn't know everything. And I never stopped praying the entire time. But, but this is what's missing the most in the church today. It's faithfulness. When the pastor can't trust in particular, look at Jesus, faithful to him who appointed him. If the pastor can't trust the ones who work with him in the church, guys, you've got a problem. The problem in the church today is you got associate pastors jockeying for the position of the pastors. You got youth pastors jockeying for the position of the pastor. You got other deacons and other, and everybody's going. Guys, I'm going to tell you something. If you can't leave this church and say something good about me, we've got a problem. If you can't leave here, because I hear people doing this all the time, I hear people bad mouthing their pastors. This isn't me saying I've heard something. I'm just saying, this is what goes on. I hear people bad-mouthing their pastors. And guys, and all I can think in the midst of all this is this. If there's something wrong with your pastor, you know what you need to do? Rebuke him. Yeah, that's right. If there is something in my life where I have failed you, then I should be rebuked. That means Brother Tim should come to me one-on-one, -on -one, and Brother Tim should talk to me. And if I won't listen to Brother Tim, then what should Brother Tim do? Find somebody else to go with me. And then if I still won't listen, what needs to happen? It needs to go before the whole church. If I need to be rebuked, rebuke me. 
But if you're going to be a part of this church, then you're going to serve with me. And you're going to be a part of this team. And it doesn't just go for the ones in leadership positions, but it goes for each and every person in the church. If you can't believe in your pastor, if you can't have faith in your pastor, if you come here because you've got this goal to knock the pastor down so that you can move in, so that you can move somebody else in, you need to move out. Because it seems like all that goes on in the churches today is we want to move this guy in and move that guy out. And we'll do whatever we have to do to get it done. Guys, and I'll just go ahead and say it. Because this is why the Word says what is. Jesus was faithful to Him who appointed Him. Amen. Brother, Brother Mark David, Brother Brian, I give you all a lot of responsibilities around here. I'll just call it straight. If you can't be faithful to me in this position, then you won't be faithful to God, you won't be faithful to your wives, and you won't be faithful to this congregation. Brother Roger. Guys, it's a high call. Faithfulness name means to rely. If you're the pastor of the church, if you can't rely on the people that you count on the most, if I can't rely on you, guys, you might as well just go ahead and stab me in the back. Because if this church, guys, if you've heard me say it, I've said it over and over. What's happened at Mountain View from the day we started with 10 people here to where we were when we had 62 a week ago? It ain't me. Everything that's happened here has been because... was faithful in his house as a servant. This church is made of so many good servants. This church is made of so many people that want to serve and be a part of the team. Whatever it is that happens here, it's because I can count on Brother Roger. It's because I can count on Brother James Agin. I can count on Mark David. I can count on Brother Brian. I can count on Brother Danny, and I already know it. And you've only been here for two months. I can count on Brother Tim Smith. I can count on Sister Sandra Byers. I can count on Sister Burma Bell. I can count on Brother Russell. <laughs> Glad that went on camera. I fell into Brother Russell. And you would have caught me. That's how I can count on you. Guys, it's what's missing in the church today. It literally is. It's what's missing in the church today. Pastors stand up and you think, he doesn't have a lot of authority in how he preaches. He doesn't have authority because there's no one backing him up when he's in the pulpit. Because he's having to preach out of fear that someone's trying to take his job away. We need people that are going to be counted as faithful. You need people you can rely on. And guys, I'm making the example in the pulpit but I'm going to also take the example to your house one of the big things I do one, ladies I love y'all men I love you but if I ever catch brother Roger you bad mouth and sister Melinda I'm going to rebuke you <laughs> sister Melinda if I ever catch you bad mouth and brother Roger now if you're doing it in front of them that's one thing <laughs> I may just stand back and be like, well, it looks like they're working it out. <laughs> but guys, that's one of the things I see all the time. I see people like behind their husband or behind their wife's back talking bad about their husband, talking bad about their wife. Guys, it can't work that way. Faithfulness, faithfulness means a lot more Faithfulness means a lot more than just read and know and you're not looking at other women. Faithfulness means your wife, Brother Tim, knows that you're behind her and you support her. And whatever you say in public, you're 100% for her on her team. Brother Mark and Caitlin, whatever goes between you two, the public... Brother Mark David could be, for all I know, he's the biggest slob that's ever lived on the earth. For all I know, your house is covered in dirty underwear thrown everywhere right now. 
That was probably way too much to be throwing out on here. That could be the realities of it. But you know what the public is going to hear? You got a wonderful husband and you love him. Now when you get home, it might be like, Pastor Dunn knows about your dirty drawers. Now get in there and clean up. I told you. <laughs> Mark David's going to move to the back next week. <laughs> but guys, it's it's not just the pulpit, but it's the marriage, it's the home. Guys, it's your workplace. I literally, this is the first time in my life I've ever had anybody work for me before. And, and so it's kind of like blowing my mind. I don't have to do everything at work anymore. Miss Angela, if you watch this, hey, shout out. She's been great. And it's just been like this. And I can already tell she's only been in the job like three weeks. But like I've already seen, she says she's going to do something. She does it. And this is blowing my mind because I've gotten used to a lot of people in the world that I'm going to do something. Okay, I believe it when I see it. And I know I'm not the only one, right? Guys, faithfulness has to start at home. Faithfulness goes into the church. I already said it. If you can't be faithful to your husband, you're not going to be faithful to God. If you can't be faithful to your pastor, you're not going to be faithful to God. If you're not going to be faithful, now I'm going to really get things. If you're not faithful with your giving, if you're not faithful with your serving, if you're not faithful with your time, if you're not faithful with everything that God gives you, guys, you've left, you've left yourself exposed. You want to be the husband you've always needed to be? It starts with your faithfulness. It starts with your wife knowing, I can count on you. Guys, one of the biggest things I want you to know that what I do here at this church it's not just words every week when I say it. If you need me, you call me. Amen. You call me at one in the morning. I ain't saying I'll be happy when I first answer. <laughs> but I'll answer. I'll answer. My phone, the ringer stays on and it stays next to my head. Because I don't want to miss a 1 a.m. text message from somebody that needs prayer. If you call me, I'll be there. Faithful means you can rely on someone. I need to rely on the people in this church. This church, if you're sitting in this church today and you're like, I don't know how to serve, I promise I can find the place for you to serve in this church. But if you serve, I need it to be reliable. If Brother Brian starts showing up every other Sunday to teach Sunday school, I can't trust Brother Brian with that anymore. If my piano plays every other Sunday, oh wait. Y'all do play every other... JK, right? <laughs> Guys, I need, you got to be faithful. It's got to start somewhere. Because if you can't be faithful in your relationship, if you can't be faithful to the family of God, if you can't be faithful to your pastor, how are you ever going to be faithful to God? It's got to start somewhere. It's got to start sometime. So why not let it start now? But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. And some people look at verse 6 and they try and make it like a, oh, if you hold fast, this is where you can lose your salvation. If you do this, guys, it's not an if-then statement. What the verse is saying is this. You don't know how you can tell somebody's really saved? It's because they're, they're always there. They're always consistent. You can tell a real Christian because they're just there. When things get tough, they're still there. On the worst day and the worst hour, they still say, God, I'm going to serve you. The faithfulness never ends. 
Even on the worst day of your life, the faithfulness you have is still there every single day. It's a part of who you are. It defines you and part of your being. That that's what you are. You can count on me. Where you are right now in your relationship with God. I wonder if you can have God look at you right now and God look at you and God know I can count on you. Are you the faithful servant? You know, we say it all the time in church, Matthew 25, 21. Well done, good and faithful servant. What are you going to hear at the end of everything? When it's all said and done, what are you going to hear? Will you hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Man, that pastor of ours can't preach his way out of a tote sack. You need another pastor. Have you talked to the pastor about it? Man, that boss of mine. Oh, I'll get somebody fired this week. <laughs> Sam's going to go to work. My preacher told me I need to rebuke you. <laughs> you know, if your boss is a Christian. Yeah. If he fires you, then you'll know he wasn't really a Christian. First John's at First John two nineteen. They went out from us because they were never one of us in the first place. <laughs> you can just walk out on your way out the door. Guess he wasn't really a Christian. You... Test that <laughs> <laughs> just saying hypothetically. <laughs> Guys, what are you going to hear when everything is over? That's right. Guys, if I let you down, it's because I'm still. Sometimes it's hard to be a woman, giving all your love to just one man. If I let you down, it's because I'm just a man. Here, I'll step down here because I don't want you thinking I'm any better than. If I let you down, it's because I'm just a man. But I want you to know that I love you. I want you to know if you need me, I'm here for you. We're going to open up an invitation in a second. I'm going to share one last story. If you look at your life today, and you're not the faithful servant, you're not the faithful husband. You're not the faithful wife. You're not the faithful worker. You're not who you need to be. Then this is that opportunity to which you say, God, tomorrow is going to be a different day. Amen. That's a beautiful thing about church, isn't it? With each opportunity that this altar opens, it's an opportunity for you if we confess our sins, He is righteous and just to forgive us our sins. If you remember that verse, it was present tense. Which means there ain't a day that's going to go by that you don't need to work on something. I promise, even as a pastor of this church, there's not a day goes by I don't need to work on something. You ask my wife, she'd probably tell you I need to work on a lot. But she wouldn't do it behind my back. <laughs> She would tell me right to my face. You better believe she would. <laughs> Guys, this is the opportunity. I don't know what yesterday was or the day before, but tomorrow is a brand new day. What you choose to do tomorrow, you can start today. Today you can become the husband that you've always needed to be. You can become the wife that you've always needed to be. You can become the servant in the church that you always needed to be. You can become the father that you need to be. You can become the adopted mom that you need to be today. But this is the day that you can decide, I'm not going to be what I've always been. I'm going to be who God has called me to be this day. On my way to church this morning, me and David talked in the car because he'd been getting shy about speaking from people. He used to a long time ago, some of y'all may remember, would open the church in prayer and talk a lot, and he started getting a little 
like this. And it was just funny. Brother Brian, me and Brian, Brother Brian didn't talk. So Brother Brian called on David Allen this morning just out of pure God thing, you know, David Allen pray. Because me and David talked in the way, because David, if y'all never talked theology with David, David knows more theology than a lot of people. You'd be surprised. But the kid's heard preaching like every day of his life at this point. And like he's heard messages at night for almost his whole life now. And I told David, I was like, David, you've gotten a little shy lately, but God's gave you a gift. And if you don't use that gift, he'll give it to someone else. So whenever you have the opportunity to serve, guess what you need to do? You serve. It's what you do. And I was so proud of him today when he come back there and gave me a high five in the back because the time come and he was on it. Guys, God's gave each one of you a gift. If you don't know where you need to serve, come talk to me. Come talk to Brother Roger. Talk to Sister Nikki. Talk to my wife. I promise they need help back there. Come talk to me. We'll find you a place to serve and put you on the team. Come saw some firewood. We'll find a place for you in this church. I'm going to go back to that opening verse as I close this. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ. As we sing the last song and play, I want you to take a moment. I want you to consider Jesus today. I want you to consider your relationship. I want you to consider your role as a, as a servant. I want you to take a hard look at yourself as a husband, as a father, as everything that it is you need to be in this world. Take a hard look at yourself today and you consider it. You look at Jesus Christ and if you've never called him Lord of your life and said, God, I belong to you. You've heard me say it a hundred times, a thousand times. But salvation, it's A, B, C, A, admit you're a sinner, B, believe Jesus died for you, C, confess and commit your life to Jesus Christ. God, I'm going to serve you. God, put me on that team. God, put me in the game. I'm ready to serve. I'm ready to do something. I want to be. You notice what he said about Moses? What was he left with? Was faithful in all his house as a servant for a for a testimony you want a testimony you ain't got to use words to get a testimony Amen. you'll get it by people watching you That's right. and how you lead your life and how you serve the Lord Amen. last thing I'll say is this <laughs> I think I've said that four times now right the last thing I'll say this time I mean it I'm turning off the clicker so I can't change my mind <laughs> I put this up there every week, and it's NLT, and I love it. And I will probably always have this up as my closing slide every week from now on. I do not foresee a time when this does not close our service. For God says, at just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. Consider Jesus today. Where you are today. Um, some of y'all were with me when we went through Daniel. And one of the figures in Daniel was Antiochus Epiphanes IV. Bad dude. Really bad dude. Antiochus Epiphanes IV was on his way to Egypt. And as he came into Egypt to make war with Egypt, Rome decided he didn't need to make war with Egypt. So what did Rome do? Send an army? Rome sent one man. Rome sent one man. I'll see if I can say his name right. I cannot say his name right, but mainly because I can no longer read it on my pager. Pompilius. Oh, I said it right. Rome sent one man, an emissary named Pompilius. One man met the army of Antiochus Epiphany in the desert. One man. This is better than that 300 movie, right? One man faced an entire army. Can you imagine this? One guy coming up dressed as a Roman soldier 
And he come up and he met Antiochus Epiphanes and his army as they were coming into Egypt. Made a little bit of small talk. I wrote it down because I didn't want to mess anything up. Finally, Pompilius leaned in close to Antiochus. Didn't want to embarrass him in front of all his army and friends, you know. And he said, Abandon your invasion and go home. Abandon your invasion and go home. Antiochus and Epiphanes replied, I will consider it. Is what he said. I will consider it. Pompilius had his little scepter and he walked around them and he drew a circle around Antiochus. He drew a circle around him and he said, Consider it and decide before you leave this circle. Before you leave this circle, you consider it and you make your decision. Antiochus sat there for a moment. That may have been one man in front of him, but what did that man represent? Rome. And if you mess with Rome, Rome killed the women, the children, everybody. They salted your fields and burned the houses. Rome erased you. One man stood. Antiochus said, I will go home. I share that story today because whatever you need to make right today, you consider it before you leave this circle. If you need to make something up with your wife today, you consider it before you get out those doors today. If you need to square your account with Jesus, you do it today before you get out. Over 20 people were killed in Mississippi night before last from a tornado. Friday, six workers were killed working on the highway when a car ran out of control and flipped, took six dads out of this world that day. Every day it's the same thing. D.L. Moody once preached a sermon and he told everybody the week before the great Chicago fire, I want you to go home and I want you to think about it this week and come back next week and make a decision about Jesus. Half the people that showed up for that sermon died before the next Sunday. D.L. Moody never said, leave here and make that decision again. Today is the day of salvation. Brother Tim.